And is climate changing and what's causing it? The climate is undoubtedly changing, but the climate has always changed, so there's nothing particularly new about this. What is interesting, interesting to us, and actually disturbing, is that the rate of change, so the climate is changing as it was always done, but it's going faster. The rates of change are different to how it's been in the past. And we are, we are as confident as we are with any other area of science that this is due significantly to the emissions that we, you know, as human beings, have been put into the atmosphere, principally from burning fossil fuels, but also from the production of our food. And at this stage, you know, how far have we gone with climate change? What sort, of, what sort of changes have occurred so far, globally? Well, the changes we've seen so far are some adjustments to weather patterns. And if, certainly if you talk to some of the people in the poorer parts of the world, they're starting to see some, some changes that are different to the ones that they've experienced over the past few hundred years. They're starting to see changes in the pasture, in, in the um, rainfall patterns which change their pasture, um, how they use the pasture and uh, how often the rainfall is. So those sorts of things are starting to occur and that affects their production levels for food or affects their agricultural practices. So, that, you know, quite challenging things. But these are relatively small changes that have started to occur, that we start to identify these adjustments. Um, but we've not only seen so far a relatively small change in the temperature of about 0.8 of a degree centigrade. So it doesn't sound very much, but it's actually, from a global perspective, it's actually, it is actually quite significant. But our concern is not so much what's happened so far, but we know the emissions are going up very rapidly indeed and that, we, that what we're putting into the atmosphere locks us into climate change into the future. So what we do today affects the climate for the next 100 or 200 years. And that's, that's our real concern, that we're putting more carbon dioxide from burning more fossil fuels every single day into the atmosphere. So every day we're locking the future into higher levels of climate. So at the moment we haven't seen that much climate change, but we are, we are very confident that we're going to see some significant levels of climate change in the relatively near future and because of the fossil fuels that we're burning and the carbon dioxide that we're locking into the atmosphere. And the way we're going, without any global governance or any controls on this, what sort of temperatures do you see us reaching by the end of the century? Well, the science is really relatively clear on this. What we've, what we've got are very clear emission trends. And we, we estimated a few years ago about you know, where might um, emissions of carbon dioxide, say again from burning fossil fuels, where might they go? Could they be higher? Could they be lower? And we, ranged, we developed a range of what we call scenarios. What's worrying is we're at the very, in fact, we're slightly above the highest scenario that we could imagine. So we're emitting carbon dioxide at a faster rate than we thought we would ever do. And that's, that's no sign at the moment that's going to come down. So if we, if we carry on along that pathway, and at the moment there's no suggestion that will change, then we're talking to, about temperatures that could be as high as four, five, or six degrees C higher than we had, um, well, the, the, roughly we've got now. We often say to the pre-industrial period, but roughly compared with now. Now that doesn't sound too much if you sit in Manchester or, or somewhere in Ireland, you think four, five, six degrees might sound quite pleasant. But this is a global average, and our real concern is that actually the regional changes in that are enormous. That would mean that during heat waves, say in, if you're in Chicago and New York, Imagine the heat wave there, which is already quite challenging, add 10 or 12 degrees centigrade on top of the heat wave. So that's the sorts of changes we're seeing. I and mean, if you think of Central Europe, we're talking about 80 degrees on top of the heat wave. So the heat wave in 2003 that killed 20 to 30,000 people, you'd have 8 degrees centigrade on top of that if we carry on going as we are. So these temperatures in themselves don't sound that great, but the implications regionally are enormous. And if you take, that's incredible though in terms of what we're facing and it's hard to imagine that, yeah. but if we even say two degrees, what is two degrees going to be like? A two degrees rise from pre-industrial times? Well, th there's some uncertainty in the science about this. I mean, some scientists think that actually in the northern hemisphere we, we'll be able to cope with it um, and that by and large we can, we've got sufficient wherewithal, we've got sufficient money and ingenuity and so forth and we're, we're much less geographically susceptible to the impacts of two degrees C than some of the poor parts of the world in the, in the southern parts of the, of the planet. So some, some scientists suggest that we'll be just about okay here. Others suggest actually it will start to cause some fairly significant impacts um, even in the north. The, the, the real concern for many of us is that even at these lower temperatures like 2 degrees C, and I say we're not, we're not heading for that at the moment at all, that the implications of that for some people in the southern hemisphere, many people will die as a consequence of 2 degrees C. So although we've adopted it as this threshold between acceptable and dangerous climate change, that's a compromise that those of us in the north think we're, we're, we're on the sort of, if you like, the acceptable end of that. And that a lot of the, the poorer, more vulnerable communities in the south are on the dangerous end of that. So let's not pretend otherwise. Two degrees C is not a safe temperature rise for many people around the planet. It will certainly see many people in the poorer parts, particularly the southern hemisphere, dying as a consequence. And are you talking about millions of people? It's hard to estimate what that would be, but it, and it depends exactly how, how the two degrees C played out. So we mustn't overplay the science here. But if we see what's happening in the Philippines, now in the Philippines it's important to identify, it's not, we, we cannot say it was a climate change event, 
But those sorts of events, we expect to see an increased severity of those and, and possibly increased frequency, but, but there's still quite a lot of uncertainty around that. Certainly when you come to heat waves, we expect to see an increased severity of heat waves and droughts and an increased frequency of those sorts of things. So the two degrees C could have very serious impacts on people in the southern hemisphere, particularly as their populations are rising. Quite how many people it will affect is very difficult. Well, it will probably affect almost everyone. How many will actually die depends on a lot of other things that we put in place before that. You know, can we adapt to the impacts that we're setting in train? Um, how wealthy will the poorer parts of the communities be? So there already is a lot of discussion that perhaps the wealthy north should compensate the south so they can actually deal with the impact. So all of that will play out differently on how many people may die. But let's be clear that many, many people will be very seriously affected by climate change. M millions, if not billions, will be affected seriously by climate change, even at two degrees C in the Southern Hemisphere. And quite how many people will actually die from that is, is, is very hard to estimate. And if you take, you mentioned four, possibly five, six degrees oh, in this yeah. century, what would four degrees like? If we stabilise at 4 degrees C, and one of the big concerns is once you get the temperatures going that high, in fact, what happens is the planet feeds back and the temperatures will just keep going higher and higher to some, you know, it, we don't know where it would go, it might be 6, 7 or 8 degrees. So we might say this sort of, what some people call a runaway greenhouse effect, the discontinuities, non-linearities in the system, which mean that actually you get other feedbacks, like the melting of the permafrost in, in Russia and the Arctic, where lots and lots of methane, a very potent greenhouse gas, is locked away. Now, if that starts to come into the atmosphere, the situation could be could almost get out of control. Um, but at 4 degrees C, we're seeing, many of us would suggest that what we're seeing is, is a breakdown of the ecosystems around the planet already. So things, the big ones that people imagine, the sort of emblematic ones like the Amazon and the coral reefs and so forth. Now, most of these will be either, either destroyed or very significantly denuded from the, from the condition they're in today. Um, at the same time, we'll see massive changes in crops and food production. So some of the estimates coming out of the big modelling centres in the UK show a 40% reduction in some of the staple crops in the Southern Hemisphere. A 40% reduction at the same time the population in those parts of the world will be going up very significantly indeed. So you start to see a combination of sort of natural effects and human effects here. And many of those people who work, many of us who work on climate change, think that four degrees C is, is a world that we have to avoid at all costs. We will un very unlikely be able to adapt to it. It will have massive ecosystem impacts um, and, and it could be that it triggers ongoing impacts beyond that. So whatever we do, we have to avoid four degrees C at all costs. So if you look at what's happening, it's fossil fuels. What damage are fossil fuels doing in the atmosphere? Can you explain the basic science of that? Well, fossil fuels are, are made up mostly of carbon. And when we burn a fossil fuel, that carbon reacts with the oxygen in the atmosphere and produces um, a relatively uh, innocuous gas, carbon dioxide. And, and the carbon dioxide is already naturally in the environment. Um, but carbon dioxide plays a very important part actually in the atmosphere. It, it, it keeps the global temperature higher than it would be if carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases weren't there. So actually we're really pleased with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Just to, just to put that in some sort of perspective, if the carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases were not in the atmosphere, the average temperature of the planet would be about minus 18 degrees centigrade. So we wouldn't be here. Because the carbon dioxide is here, it's about plus 15. It makes it a very pleasant, livable place. Our concern is that as we're putting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, those temperatures, the temperature, the average temperature will go up. Now that's fine if it curves over millennia, but we're talking about it occurring just over, over you know, 100, 150 years. And no, neither life in the forms of ecosystems and other species can deal with that, and nor can we as a human society deal with that. So the concern here is the rate of change that's, that's coming about from the fossil fuels that we're burning that are putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And we're absolutely certain that the carbon dioxide increase in the atmosphere that we're, we're clearly seeing is a product of the burning of fossil fuels. There is no doubt about that. When you burn fossil fuels, there's a little clear signal if you like, in the sort of carbon that is in the atmosphere, and we, so we can identify it like a fingerprint. So we know that the, fossil, that the carbon dioxide increase in the atmosphere is from burning fossil fuels. There's no doubt about that.